So today we're going to talk about um, the traps and the pitfalls that we get into when we're building a WordPress website. Um, I think all too often, uh, you know, we take advantage of the fact that WordPress is really scalable and easy to play with and add new tools all the time. And in that, we end up uh, adding things we may not even need because our competitors are doing it, because our friends are doing it, and we think it's a good strategy for us, but it doesn't always work out that way. So, um, and in my talks, when I traditionally give talks like this, um, I encourage a good conversation back and forth. It's kind of weird sometimes to hold a conversation to the very end. Um, that being said, if you guys have anything you want to bring up during the talk, I love it when we just start to like improv a little bit because frankly, um, I never really know what I'm going to talk about until I get up here anyway. So, I'm on the Jetpack team at Automatic. Uh, I got there through a uh, acquisition. So I used to work with a bunch of guys. Uh, most of them were out of Maine, and uh, we created Brute Protect, which was the security uh, solution that helped stop brute force attacks. And so Automatic acquired us about a year ago, and we're now on the Jetpack team. And Jetpack now offers the same services that Brute Protect did. So if you have Jetpack, we are now protecting you from brute force attacks. These are the people who build it on a regular basis. We all kind of look alike with our beards and glasses. Um, you can catch me on Twitter as at Professor. I wrote a few books. Um, if you're interested in any of them, uh, let me know. Um, some of them are a little bit older than others, but uh, they're all on Amazon if you want to grab them. Next year I have a new book coming out. It's called Crafting Better Personalized Experiences. It doesn't have a title or a, a cover just yet. <coughs> uh, it will shortly. See that next year. All right, so that's a little bit of an intro about me. We're going to jump right in. Again, if anybody ever has any questions as we go through this, please. Um, I used to teach uh, at a university in Rhode Island, so I'm very used to the open report. So the first thing I want to talk about are roads. Um, I like to give this example in the beginning of a talk like this. Uh, back in 1811, uh, the commissioner created a plan uh, for New York City streets, and it was called the Great Plan. Uh, the reason for that was because they wanted to repurpose the streets to be a little bit more easy to use, to understand where you were going. That uh, streets would be horizontal west to east or east to west, and avenues would be north to south. And at any moment, if you understood those rules of how to navigate Manhattan, you could figure out where you are and which way you need to head. Um, this is what Boston looked like in 1840. <laughs> and the myth behind it is that we allowed our cart paths, uh, pulled by cows, um, these guys. To, uh, to define the roads in which we now drive here in Boston. And I'm sure a lot of you are from Boston, um, and you know how difficult it can be to get around at times, which is why now everybody just jogs or rides bikes. Um, so, you know, it just kind of goes to show a little bit of planning can go a long way. They're pretty incredible animals, right? Um, so, New York really took the time to get about what it was that they wanted. <laughs> I can usually keep a good straight face for this. I do it too many times. Um, <laughs> so New York took some time. Can we get the slides? What? Can we get the slides? Yes. Everybody will have access to the slides afterwards. Um, so New York took some time to plan, all right? Hundreds of years ago, they ripped out some, uh, some houses, they tore down some buildings, they went through a lot of pain and anguish, but because of that, they now have a very structured street, uh, uh, organized street path. And Boston, on the other hand, it's Boston, seven-way intersections with all, all of them, or none of them being one way. So, um, and the digital space is a little bit like this because in the way in which we use the, the internet, right, there are so many different ways for me to access the information on your website. And half the time, I don't even know what it is that I'm looking for on your site. I have a goal in mind, but I don't necessarily know what it is that I want to get from you until I find it. Um, 
And so in that, in that effort, um, you know, content and planning can go a really long way. And especially around your content. You have to take the time to think about what it is that your site needs to do for your users instead of just starting by creating a WordPress installation and going in there and adding pages and plugins and everything else, start with a piece of paper and write out some of the major goals that you want for your website to accomplish. What content do you want to deliver to your users? And how can they benefit from it? And these, these types of plan, this type of planning will go a long way for you. So as we get into this, I want to start talking about some rules that everybody should be abiding by. These are guiding principles by which you should never fault on. Okay? You should sacrifice on everything else but these things. So when you're building your first website, the first thing we tend to do, this isn't a rule, but this is just like, an, like a, a, a fact, we tend to make it harder than it needs to be. We get so amped up in what we think our website should be and what it should look like that we don't think about the fact that we could just simply, let's say we're creating a mechanics website. Mechanic doesn't need to, you don't need to know much more about your mechanic other than when they, where they are, what hours they're open, and what kind of cars they service, right? But we, we think, oh, well, we need a seven-page website so the SEO will pick it up, and then we need uh, their social accounts because without social media, I would never be able to get in touch with my mechanic. And then all of a sudden, I have you know, a 50-page website with more icons than I know what to do with when a, even a, just an ugly one-page website would have just worked fine for me as a user. So the point is the content is still king. It is the absolute most important thing for you to be thinking about all the time. And you should create a great content uh, architectural plan first and go from there. Uh, rule number two, less is more. If for one second you were thinking about adding a feature to your website and it, you think to yourself, I'm not sure that everybody is going to use this, they are not probably going to use it. And hold off until you know for a fact that they are going to use it. Your website should be device agnostic. What I mean by this is that it should work everywhere, all the time. It doesn't matter if it's a phone, a tablet, a laptop, a projector, a pr I don't care, it should just work. And if what you're doing, if you're adding features or tools or you have a new strategy that you're gonna put in place, but that means that it's not going to work right on a phone, don't do it, just don't. You, have to have, you would have to have a really important, strong reason to convince me that it's more important than it just working on a phone. So keep that in mind. Um, rule number four. Yeah? But you, but you can like, do something on the desktop version which you don't do on the mobile. So you're asking about how, how do you go about building for mobile? Like yeah. whether you go for desktop or mobile first? I, I prefer mobile first, um, especially in the sense that um, if, it, if you get it in and it works and looks great on mobile, then uh, um, it's probably still gonna look great on desktop. The only pitfall I send, tend to see with this is that people start to see how much extra space they have on a desktop or something like that and they start to add in more stuff. Um, but there's a lot of different strategies on that. Uh, and we can, I'm more than happy to talk to you about that again. Yeah. Uh, question on the more point. Uh, it seems that Google wants you to have a very extensive site so the question was is that Google seems to think that you need to have a very extensive, extensive large website, lots of pages, right? But you don't necessarily need that. I would say that that's not actually true anymore. I don't think Google looks at you and says, if you don't have at least five pages, you're not going to you're not going to rank. Um, it depends on what you're trying to compete against. You know, if you're ranking for a personal website and you have a one-page bio about yourself, you are very likely that you will show up for that. But if, you have, if you're competing in a very hard market, then what you need to start doing is looking at content strategy that actually provides value to users so that they're going to get benefit out of finding it in the result. And the thing about Google is, is that their job is not to rank your website better. That's not their job. Their job is to provide the absolute best value to their users who are people searching for stuff. So they don't really care if you're on page one for your own name or not. It just matters whether or not you're actually providing value when someone clicks through that link and, and reads that content. So again, it all goes back to content. Is the content that you're going to give, 
going to make people want to click on your link in Google and stay on your page. Um, so for building a social strategy, and I say this as in build, do not just implement. Don't just um, get a ready-made social kit and open the box and, and try to build a rocket on the first day. Start really slowly. Choose one social network that you actually enjoy using. I hate Facebook. I can't stand it. <laughs> and, and because of that, if I had to do a Facebook social campaign, and I didn't have the time or the energy, and I had to choose between that and Twitter, I, I would fail at Facebook. Because I don't even want to be on Facebook, so now I'm forcing myself to be there. So start in a, in a, in a way that makes sense for you personally, and your business, so that you can actually justify your time being spent in those social accounts, and it actually provides value to your users. If you're going in there with piecemeal content and you're just kind of you know, running the gauntlet of I'm gonna post three times a day for the sake of doing it, it doesn't actually build any value for anybody. So start slow and see what your users need from you. Um, last one, don't make assumptions. Um, it's, it's okay to assume that if somebody's viewing your website uh, on a desktop that they're actually viewing it on a desktop um, or in a browser or they're using a keyboard and mouse. Uh, or a trackpad, right? These are basic assumptions that we can start to make. But, the second you start to think that you understand how people are using your product, or your tools, or your apps, this is my son this morning, upside down on his bed with his iPad, and I'm sure the accelerometer is trying to tell him that he's upside down and he doesn't care because he's seven. Um, but the point is, is that you, you will see people every day find really obscure ways to use your products or your tools or your websites, um, and you have to be ready for that. And if you're not ready for it, fine, but don't force people down a certain path. Also, my son is here. He's actually at his first word camp. He's right outside in his punk Waku shirt. So if anybody wants to say hi to him, you can do that. Um, all right, so with all those rules in mind, your mission should really be great content, simply delivered. That's it. If you can just focus on these little things first, you can build a huge, awesome website over time with a great strategy. You know, this is something like akin to fitness plans, right? Like, you set up a, a time, like a Sunday, all right, it's Sunday, I'm gonna eat a pizza and a cake and have six beers, and then tomorrow, I am going to start on my diet. And when I say diet, I mean I'm going to only have 1,500 calories a day, and I'm going to go to the gym for six hours, and then I'm also going to walk 10,000 steps. And you create this whole structured plan in your mind that's impossible, unachievable, at least for me, it is. And so what we end up doing is failing, right? Because we try to implement this strategy that's near impossible. If you start with the simple stuff, if I said, starting tomorrow, I'm going to start walking an extra 2,000 steps than I normally do. That's a simple goal that I can achieve, and that's something really you can do for your website. Starting tomorrow, I'm going to start writing a really valuable piece, of, uh, like a post, once a week. And if people start reading it and liking it, maybe in a month I'll start doing it twice a week. Maybe I'll start using the photos that I take on my trips and posting those. Things like that. But once we start to overextend ourselves with promises that we can't keep, our strategies fail, and our whole system just plummets and breaks. All right, so some, for some real life examples. These are three blogs slash magazines slash digital online reading sites that I love to, to, to go to. The first is New York Times, the second is Alyssa Park, and the third is TechCrunch. And so there's some, some interesting things that we need to think about here. Um, this is the New York Times homepage. At least it was when I took this screenshot. Now, it has a lot of stuff going on. There are a lot of links, a lot of calls to actions, a lot of things to see. Why is their homepage like this? It's because they assume nothing about you when you arrive at their homepage. They don't know what you're interested in, what you're looking for. It could be uh, news, it could be 
uh, humor pieces, it can be whatever is on your mind at that time. So they try very hard to make a simplistic way of showing you all the options that you have on this one website. So there's so many choices and so many things to see. But the thing that we have to remember is that the homepage is really starting to die in the sense of what it used to be. Your homepage is a home, I guess, but it's not your landing page, right? It, it's not the page it was 10 years ago or five years ago where everybody would just type in your URL and then start to search your site and find what they're looking for. Search engines have become so advanced that you don't ever have to search on a site ever again. If you were going to find an article that you knew existed on New York Times, would you type in newyorktimes.com and type in the search and try to find that article, or would you just Google it? This is what I would do. Same thing goes for Amazon. You want a product and you want to buy it from Amazon, my first step is to go, um, like, I don't know, whatever I'm buying today, uh, a new iPad, a new remote. I would type this in to Google and say, on Amazon, or just use the word Amazon, so that it takes me exactly right where I want to go. And it's one less click, it's one less step. And so the point is, is that, that we can't make assumptions about where people are going to land on our sites. We have to assume that at every page on our home, or on our site, is a home page. Alyssa Park does this really well. They feature content on the home page, um, but they also give you a lot more to look at that is related to that content. But there aren't that many distractions. There, aren't that, there isn't that much stuff going on. TechCrunch is another example of a site that has so much going on for itself, and it needs to. I mean, they have tens of thousands of articles. But if you don't have to have this kind of content always readily available, I would say strip it out and start slower. So the thing that we have to remember, too, about content is that it, it happens on my terms. It happens the way in which that I want to view it. I mean, I can browse your site, I can subscribe via RSS if you still allow me to, uh, email subscriptions, newsletters, social media. If you're a fan of the uh, push-up tool from 10 is there any, any 10 uppers here? There. Um, so the push-up tool is super cool. Basically, you get a desktop notification if your favorite blog uh, posts a new post, um, and it's right on your desktop, it's not in your browser. And uh, again, just another example of another way in which I'm going to find and consume your content. So you need to focus your efforts on having genuinely great content that will benefit the users. Don't do any kind of bait and switch. Don't try to help people in a way that doesn't make sense. Um, don't try to compete with your competitors for the sake of competing. If you have actual value to give, people will recognize that for you. And, or and Google will do that too. Once you have them, your next goal should be turning one-time visitors into fans. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do this in a few, in a few forward slides, but you have that opportunity at that moment. You've introduced yourself. You have a first-time impression with your user. If I come to a site and I might, maybe I get some good content out of it, um, but there's 70,000 links and 20 ads and a pop-up that asks me to subscribe to a newsletter, I don't even know if your newsletter provides any value, this is my first time to your site. That is stuff that's just going to drive me away. And then you start to get into things where um, you get ads, this ad revenue cycle. I'm going to talk about it in a second, but you know how you get to these sites where uh, they break up the content into different slides, right? And then to, to view, uh, you know, a sixth slide thing on the, like, the six pools gadgets, you end up visiting six pages with six ad refreshes, and all you know, you just want to see a list of that content, but they're doing that to keep you on the page longer, to get more views on the ads and everything else. And those are the worst reasons to do that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> give them a reason to stay, provide <clears throat> sorry, provide interaction, provide something for them to do and use on your site. Provide discussion. Give them an opportunity to comment, to link to your post on social media, make that really easy so that you can start a discussion with them and, and talk to them and chat with them. Um, <clears throat> I like the idea of painting a bigger picture. So if you are like me and you blog about random stuff about UX, uh, lifestyle stuff, working in the industry, I always put like quotes up from people and things that I like. Um, 
But when I do that, if I have like a quote of the day, and you land on that for whatever reason, maybe I tweeted it, and I don't have anything else on that page related to what my site's about, I haven't helped you understand what I'm blogging about, what I'm writing about. Why would you subscribe to me at that moment? Because I quoted Gandhi one time. It's not worth it for you. So you have to help people understand what it is that you're doing on that site and why they need to pay attention to it. I just said this before, be aware of the ad revenue cycle. If your site's job is to generate revenue for you and it does it through advertising, you're going to be faced with a very slippery slope that you have to decide whether or not you're going to go down. And the minute you go down it, it can become very dangerous in, in a way that you end up looking like a spammy site. You can end up having so much, more, so many more ads than actual content that people don't actually gain value from your stuff. How many times do we see the clickbaity titles on Facebook like um, kitten? Uh, sees cucumber, you won't believe what happens next, right? And then you, <laughs> like, you click it and you see like a cat and a cucumber and then to get to like actually play the video, there's actually like seven play buttons, but six of them are ads, right? And it's all just a joke to get you to click on an ad. I mean, that stuff is garbage. And, and the, the worst thing that I, and the worst part about it is that there are so many of those sites now that I have no idea what's what. So you know what I end up doing? I end up like defriending people because I just don't even want to be bothered with that kind of stuff. So just be aware of that kind of stuff. So how can we do better? Well, I've been thinking about this for a long time. And I'm actually coming up with a open source blogging strategy that um, is going to be supported by a free theme that I'm working on now. And uh, the team at Lynchpin is gonna, are gonna lend a hand. And if anybody else wants to lend a hand, more the merrier, honestly. But I really want a theme that can support a new strategy. A new way of blogging and a new way of writing content. And the reason is, is that we have been stuck, I think personally, in the free theme world where it's either a business site, a portfolio site, or a blog. And every single one has the exact same content types and everything is working exactly the same way. Everything starts with 10 posts on a page then you have pagination, and it, and it just goes from there, and everything, even though they look different, and you have some really minimalistic blogs that are gorgeous, and some really great portfolio sites with awesome sliders, and all these other tools, at the end of the day, if I strip away all the UI, right, and I just look at the content architecture of the site and the way in which the flow works for users, they're all the same, every single one of them. So I say let's start with a clean slate. Done. That was easy. So here's the design for the new theme that I'm working on. This is a post that I wrote a while ago. And when you arrive at a site like this, you can tell immediately, the only thing I care about right now is that you enjoy my article. That is it, that's the only thing I want you to do. I do provide some information about myself so that you can gain value in the fact that like it's someone who knows what they're talking about and knows what they're doing and that's what they're writing so it actually supports the article but it gives you the opportunity to link and see other things that are doing on the site there's no navigation there's no sidebar by default this theme will not have these things of course it'll be open source everybody can add to it you can build on it any way you want to the point of this is to keep help people write faster with better value and to allow the users to consume better so, as we start to scroll down, the first thing I want to focus on is a social strategy. So all too often, you as a business or even as a person will start to say to yourself, well, if I don't have a presence on Google+, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Vine, Instagram, God knows what else, all these other places, then people won't be able to see me where they want to see me. And that means that I have to have 17 icons in my header so that people can find where to find me on social media and they can take my content with me. I say that's complete BS. You don't need to do that. If I like your content enough, I will find you on Facebook. It's just the plain and simple of it. You can provide a link for me and make my life easier, sure. But if I enjoy your content, truly enjoy it, like if I, I love TechCrunch. If they didn't have a link to their Facebook account, I would go to Facebook not that I would do that because I hate Facebook, but I could go to Facebook and type in TechCrunch and find their Facebook page. 
So start slow. And the strategy that I'm talking about here is that we start with your own account and we start a few days in advance. So you're coming out with a really great article. Tease your users. I wrote this tweet. My laser pointer's not working anymore. I wrote that tweet a few days in advance. And embeddable tweets make it super easy to throw right into the article. So now this becomes a block quote that supports the article, but also provides value for the user and gives them an opportunity to follow me, retweet that tweet, favorite that tweet, or reply right in the article. And it's done pretty cleanly, nicely, and it doesn't actually bombard or, or cause any strain to the user. I think I got your question. You're saying that the, the um, having a few days in advance. So I didn't link to anything in that tweet. So there, it was just to start a discussion on Twitter. Yeah, so it was just a tweet. Uh, so all I did is I just tweeted out <clears throat> that topic, and then it got a retweet, a couple favorites, and I talked to a few people about it, and started a discussion. Then when I wrote the article, I was able to embed the tweet in. So now they're actually able to interact with my Twitter account and do all those things with one click and continue reading the article. It's nice to have things broken up. Break up your content so it's easy for skin. We know this is normal content strategy 101 stuff, but a nice big block quote makes it really easy to get the gist of something you know, in the article. Breaking up your content in the sense that you have headlines makes it easier to read, understand where you are in the article and how it's progressing. My major calls to action here are huge, but they're elegant, right? They don't look ugly, they don't look, they're not screaming with big neon arrows. I might even like wash them out a little bit so they're a little bit more opaque. I didn't get around to that yet. But at this moment, the options are Twitter or Facebook. I'm not presenting you with 50 options. Okay? I'm not making it harder. And what's gonna happen when they click on these links? It's not the run of the mill link to an article <clears throat> and have it post to Twitter. For example, they are all going to come pre-filled with conversation starters. I have a question for, I have a, this or that, the other thing. And what will happen is, is then people will be able to click on it and write their tweet or their Facebook post in a little mobile that'll pop up right over this and start a conversation with me directly or the community about this article. I have personally chosen to rip comments out of this view. It depends heavily on whether or not you can support it and whether or not your users actually tend to use it. I know a lot of blogs out there that do really well with comments and they, and they have a lot of great discussions on them. But then there are other sites that just don't have it. On my site, people prefer to talk to me, and it's probably because I drive them to social media um, to talk to me on Twitter and Facebook. So for me personally, I'm ripping out the discussion altogether that's going to happen on the site, and I'd rather focus somewhere else. Yeah? No pictures. That one article had no pictures, no. Mm. So the question was that you know, there's no pictures, but if we scroll back up, there are actually things broken up in here that do the same work as an image. But as I've been saying, don't add something for the sake of adding something. If you don't have a quality photo to go along with the article, don't add it. One of the things I can't stand is when you see some obscure photo that makes absolutely no sense that goes along with the, the, the article just for the sake of going along with it. Um, all right, so <clears throat> what's next? Normally we'd see something like related posts, right? Uh, to keep people engaged. Well, that's fine. You can do that. And my favorite tool for that is Jetpack. I know I'm biased, but I used it for many years before I even joined Jetpack. Um, and it's brilliant. The way it works, how easy it is, and how accurate it is, it works great. The cool thing about Jetpack is that you can actually do it any way you want to. You can query the next related posts. So it would be very easy for someone with just minor development skills to say, instead of showing me three little blocks of related posts or like little widget size stuff um, to combine it with infinite scroll <clears throat> and do something more like this. So the next article just starts. 
right after the first one. Because what we have to remember is that landing page is your home page, right? And what would you do on your home page? Would you show one article? Probably not. So this gives an opportunity for us to start reading right into the next article right away. So if you combine infinite scroll from Jetpack and you combine related posts, you are now seeing a dynamic page personalized for that user in time, in real time for them essentially, that never ends. This page will just go and go and go, and they can choose to interact with whatever it is that they want to interact with, any articles that they want to, and there's no clicking into the article. The last little bit that I have to write something up for this and give it out for free would be that as you scroll through these articles, your focus would change the URL. So if you just decide to grab the URL, it would change. It would take you right to that article. I'll have to write that up and, and give that out for free. Um, and there's a few. There's a lot more stuff that I want to talk about with this strategy. It's something that I'm very passionate about. But I think it's time for us to really start to look at a way in which we can support a content-first strategy with uh, a blog. But now on to another real life example. I'm going to pick on restaurants because it's my favorite industry to give a hard time to. <clears throat> I still don't understand how it's 2015 and I can't get onto a good restaurant website. We know exactly what visitors want. When I go to your restaurant website, <clears throat> I could care less about what special you had three weeks ago that you forgot to update, right? I want your address, I want your phone number, I want your hours because I don't want to go to your location and see a locked door. I want to know what's on the menu tonight. And if any of you paid me $5 today, I would build you the ugliest but best experience restaurant website. Because I can do it in five minutes. I'll, I'll give you a story. So I have a seven-year-old son. He's out there in his Wapu shirt learning about WordPress. And uh, on occasion, he gets to sleep over at grandma's, which means that my wife and I get the morning to ourselves, which is awesome, sleep in. And that mor one morning, we woke up when we decided uh, we were gonna go for brunch. Oddly enough, in Rhode Island, it's hard to find a brunch place. I went online, on my phone, in bed. And it's important note to make is that just because somebody's on a mobile device doesn't necessarily mean that they're mobile, right? Again, don't make assumptions. Right? I'm not going to get out of bed, go find my laptop, get back in bed. I got my phone. I'm just going to get on there. So I start searching around, Googling, trying to find a brunch website, or a restaurant website for a restaurant that serves brunch. And I found this one. And the website looks good. It's responsive. I got the menu. I got the, hour, or the, the phone number right at the top. So we're on a good track here for the rules in which I think a restaurant website should be based. When I scrolled down, I saw the contact us information, which made me very happy. I scrolled down just a little bit further, and I saw the hours. I saw that on that Sunday morning, they were open at 10 a.m. Fantastic. We're on the right track. Like, this is a website that's actually doing a good job, and I'm proud of it. Like, I am proud of it. I'm like, I'm going to go eat here because they did a good job. I don't care what they serve. Um, I click on menus, and it's a little cluttered. And I see all these different menus, but I'm like, oh, brunch. They tell me right away they have a brunch menu. Super cool. I click the brunch menu and I get a seven megabyte PDF. Son of a bitch. I was so pissed. I was on track for being a giant fan of this restaurant. I was gonna like move in and live there and just eat their whatever kind of food they had. But all I know is like Indian Jamaican fusion. I don't know. So they did a good job building a responsive website. They did a really bad job giving me a huge PDF file. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so trying to view a PDF menu on my phone is painful. The worst part about this was that every single one of these links linked to the same exact PDF. <laughs> so I downloaded the same PDF twice. Luckily I was on Wi-Fi. All of this made me just give up on life and wish that Domino's had some kind of breakfast pizza because I didn't want to get out of bed for anything at that point. So at the end of the day, that's a good, that's a good website. It's a good website. They did a good job. 
They didn't try to bombard it with 50 photos of all their entrees and take photos of their chefs in the back with big fake smiles on and people, stock photos of people drinking beer at the bar and all that. They didn't do that. They focused on the important things that I need at that moment, especially on a mobile phone. Those are the most important things. And in past talks, I've talked about how restaurants should be giving out proximity coupons if you use GPS and you realize that they're within uh, you know, walking distance of you, especially in an urban area like Boston, you can give away a free appetizer if they come in in the next 10 minutes. You get people walking past 50 other restaurants to get that free app. Those are things that are really important, but they didn't focus on the tiniest little detail. Creating a non-PDF menu is not that difficult. It's not, especially in 2015. That one little thing, that lack of, of caring for me, and the situation that I was in turned me off to the whole situation. So just be aware of that. Again, providing the most important elements of your site to anyone on any device at any time is the way to go. So next thing I want to talk about is site personalization. Uh, we can learn a lot about our users very, very quickly. And this is where it gets into the realm of if you own a business, you can hire someone to do this if you're a developer. Um, you can start to do this stuff on your own. There are tools out there to help you. Um, but if you start to keep an eye on things and cookie, you can cookie, you can ask for GPS uh, information, you can ask for location uh, without GPS, you can do a whole variety of things. Um, if you create really amazing uh, tags and category architecture, you can start to help people um, drive into the right parts of your site very quickly. Um, if you ever saw a blog in the back end that was tagged beautifully, maybe a thousand posts, maybe they have 5,000 tags, and it was done right, um, that, that, that is gold. That is such gold, because you can turn tags into navigation items. Tags can be subscribed to. There's just so much you can do with it, and it helps you to create like the poor man's uh, personalized website. Uh, so you can start to have keywords inside of posts. If you start to recognize that you wrote a 4,000 word article and you know people are starting to get distracted with the content, maybe their mouse is moving to something else and they're gonna click on something else, at that moment you can start to present them with different options. Would you like to see this? Would you like to move on to a different article? But you can't do that without a really great content architecture. Then I had an idea uh, for marking things right. Um, everybody's seen this UI before, right? What does the blue dot mean? What does that mean? It's unread, right? Is it ugly? Is it in your way? Is it invasive? Does it hurt your eyes to look at it? No. But every part of your body wants to make that blue dot disappear. <laughs> And then you can get a beer, because you did a good job. So that blue dot is the tiniest little piece of UI that you have to, in, to create interaction for your users. If you add a blue dot, if you add the word unread next to a blog title, if you create a little flag, whatever you want to do, all of a sudden your users have a reason to stay. They have a to-do list. And if you get smart with it, and you start to remove posts that have been read from the view. Remember I talked about having a strategy where your blogs <clears throat> have an infinite scroll of related posts, and they scroll in order of related content to what you landed on? As you start to read those and you arrive the next day and the next day, you would do unread and related so they wouldn't see it again. They could always search for it, if, or if they bookmark it, they would always be able to look back to it. But the point is that you're always presenting fresh, related content to your users, personalizing your website for your users in real time for that. So this is, I said about halfway, that's not even close to true. How do those things I can't hear you. How can you do this unread things using existing things? So how, how can we do it? How can we make it happen? Is that what you said? Yes. Uh, so I'm not quite halfway, but I'm on the way to creating a plugin. That's the GitHub link if anybody wants to join and have a discussion. Right now I basically set up a settings page. 
but I'm going to make this a free plugin. And what it's going to do is going to cookie your users, and it's going to keep track of the posts they have read, and all it's going to do is add a class to your blog post of read or unread in real time for those users. So, you can design your site any way you want to. I'm not going to force a blue dot, a flag, a bolded title versus an unbolded title, like whatever. I'm not going to do those things. I'm just going to add a class, and then I'm going to add the ability for you to query only unread posts. Those are the only two things this, pl this, this plugin will do. Once I get around to it, Shada from WP Engine has been hounding me for like ever. Um, so, again, as a busy person and uh, working in an amazing community, if anybody wants to lend a hand with it, I'm all for it. I would love some help. Uh, but this is going to be released with the blogging strategy and the theme. So we're going to kind of do like a whole rollout where the, not only is the theme going to be released, but I'm going to write like an ebook for the strategy and post that on GitHub that anyone can fork and change and add uh, you know, strategies to. They can do some user testing and actually provide some real value back to the community. So we're kind of ending our session here. Uh, I want to kind of recap. Uh, so what did we learn? Cows did not actually pave the roads in Boston, but they might as well have. Um, it's OK, because Boston's still beautiful. Uh, the underlining thing in my talk today was that personalization improves traction, it improves engagement. The more your website is custom tailored to me, the better. But you have to be smart about it. I don't know if you, anybody read about the new patent that uh, Apple filed for. With the uh, They're going to track your the, the amount of money you have left in your account. You serve up um, apps to you that are within your budget. Um, stuff like that gets a little creepy. Um, you know, using somebody's location and telling them that you're one, you know, you're around the corner from me, you want to hang out, that's creepy. Don't do that stuff. <laughs> um, but just be smart about it. Um, you need to build better restaurant websites. That's something we learned today. Um, but more importantly, we need to reward our visitors. Um, when you do that, they become fans. When you give them even the slightest little thing to feel good about, on red posts versus red posts, or interacting with related content, um, things like that, they start to feel good about what they're viewing and seeing on your site, and they like that. As always, I didn't actually say that much, but test. Test is the most important thing, especially if we're rolling out like a, a bigger strategy beyond the limits of what you've normally done. Um, A-B test beforehand. Uh, test afterwards, test forever, just test. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have like one minute questions? One minute? Okay. We have one minute. We've asked a few questions as it went on, so I won't be too insulted if you don't have any questions now. No? Does anybody want to know where I got that cow video? I shot it myself at a farm in Cranston, Rhode Island. Yeah. Landon's fifth birthday. Fourth birthday. Yeah. That's it? Cool. Well, thank you all for coming out. Which, uh, presenta which uh, presentation are you using? Which one? It's not called. I am sorry, it's okay. What software are you using for the What did you do before? What you Where will I have it? No, the presentation. What, uh, what Keynote. Keynote? Yeah. Yeah. No. Sure. And uh, hit me up on Twitter. Um, and uh, my website is jesse, jes.se.com. That's where I'll post the slides. And if we have a recording, I'll post that too. Thank you.